You're watching Psalm 100, which is a special three-hour program from Big Centre TV commemorating the Battle of the Somme. As we said at the end of the big magazine bulletin, things weren't quite so rosy as officials would, at first at least, have us believe. The First World War is such a big experience that most people can't really understand it in terms of its scale and complexity. What we can understand is its impact on individuals and the individual dead or the individual wounded or the individual who, and they were by far the majority, simply fought through it, came home and got on with their lives. But it seems at the very least a matter of respect for those people to explain why it was that the battle was being fought. This was an attempt in the middle year of the war for the Allies to coordinate their efforts to break the German army, to inflict such damage on it that it would never recover. And with hindsight, we can say they did that, but it took a long time to have an effect. And how much the Battle of the Somme contributed to that will always remain controversial. By the end of the first day, British casualties totaled 57,000 men, of which 20,000 had been killed. And the Battle of the Somme went on for 140 days and 10,000 more British and Empire soldiers died. As a result of that, 73,000 soldiers of no known grave are commemorated as a memorial to the missing at Tietro. Amongst them are the names of 604 men from the South Staffordshire Regiment and a further 1,800 or so from the other local regiment the Royal Warwickshire Regiment. Stephen Badsey is the Professor of Conflict Studies at Wolverhampton University and he recently spoke to members of the Western Front Association in Birmingham. The title of his talk was Could the Battle of the Sun Have Been Won? Your, your talk today was Could the Battle of the Sun Have Been Won? Uh, I dare say it's a very complex, long answer that you could take hours and hours over but in summary, what's your view? Could the battle have been won? It, the Battle of the Somme couldn't have been won in the sense that the British could not have defeated Germany on the Western Front in 1916. It could have been fought better by both sides. It was a... Excuse me. It was a remarkable achievement of a British army created almost from nothing two years earlier, that it fought as well as it did. But ultimately, you can't get away from the level of dead and casualties which the British Army suffered on the Somme, for which it will always be remembered. Mm -hmm. And the average man in the street always thinks of this lions led by donkeys. What, how do you stand on that phrase? British generals of the First World War weren't as bad as people think they were. Um, now that may sound like faint praise, we appreciate, uh, but we're much more aware now of the unique circumstances they faced. This was mass industrialised war of a type that nobody had ever seen before in history. Uh, they were struggling with immense problems, they made a lot of mistakes, ultimately the British were on the winning side and their generals did well. But there's a long process to get there. And in the middle year of the war, 1916, on the Somme, uh, a number of British generals did turn out to be inept. And a lot of people died because of it. That doesn't mean that all British generals were inept or foolish all the time. Far from it. Mm -hmm. The general that many people, in average man in the street knows, of course, is General Haig. So what, what's your overall view of Haig? Haig is still a controversial character after a hundred years, which is quite remarkable. Uh, he was born in the reign of Queen Victoria. He's a historical figure, and we've got to see him like this. Uh, comments about Haig tend to be based on whether you personally would have liked to have shared a cup of tea with him, uh, which isn't actually the best way of evaluating. He wasn't a very nice personality, but then neither was the Duke of Wellington. And this is again uh, an aspect which needs to be detached from his generalship. Uh, himself, he was absolutely ruthless in his commitment to fighting on the Western Front, 
and he actually fought through to victory, which is something that a lot of people found it very hard to forgive him for. The question of General Haig, of course, is one which continues to divide the nation, as Professor Badsey was referring to there. It certainly does continue to divide opinion, certainly in this country, but in France it's slightly different. In 2009, it was the 90th anniversary of Haig leaving Montreal, where he had his headquarters. There was a special ceremony which was held there, and the local townsfolk turned out in huge numbers for a special commemorative service. General Haig had his headquarters from 1916 at Montreal. Today, this statue of him dominates the town square. In May 2009, local people commemorated the 90th anniversary of Haig leaving the town with a special service. Montreuil-sur-Mer was chosen as the general headquarters of the British expedi <coughs> Expeditionary Forces from 1916. Montreuil became an extremely important place for the part of the front line held by the British Empire troops. We must learn the lesson from this conflict which led to World War II, especially with its human consequences, the civil victims and the crazy Nazi extermination of the Jews and the Gypsies. The then political leaders believed that the war was not going to last long. 126 men from Montreuil died on the battlefields. It is our responsibility and duty to pass the memory of those who gave their lives to allow a democracy to live and perpetuate on the next generations. The German army had been present on the Somme from the early winter of 1914 and they developed a, a massively complex network of trenches. These included forward trenches, usually two trenches, sometimes three trenches, which were within perhaps 100 and 150 yards of each other, which mutually supported each other. Uh, in addition to that, there were uh, complexes of more um, uh, carefully prepared positions in the frontline villages which the German army had taken over. They'd tunneled underneath, they'd produced uh, shell-proof dugouts and they produced a network of machine gun positions. That didn't mean that every machine gun was actually uh, uh, in occupancy of every machine gun position, but Machine guns can be moved from position A to position B. So depending on artillery and the likelihood of attack or being uh, over on a particular position, machine guns could be taken to other locations. Uh, but in addition to those frontline villages, there were also uh, more complex networks of um, uh, fortifications which were uh, support redoubts, uh, and then uh, intermediate lines and uh, a second fallback position which on the Somme had been mostly constructed. So in order to get across uh, a German defensive position and break through into more open country, uh, the British troops would have to cross at least five and sometimes six lines of trenches that were prepared for fire. Uh, the trenches were approximately 10 feet deep. Soldiers could go for weeks on end and only see the sky. They would never look over the parapet of the trench except early in the morning to scan no man's land in front of themselves uh, or perhaps when they were being relieved they would march out and they may be able to see their position over land but that would usually be at night so you had a situation where frontline troops the other ranks as people often disparagingly call them the privates the lance corporals the sergeants 
very often they had no real idea of the layout of the terrain in front of themselves except when they saw it very very briefly in the early morning or perhaps late in the evening and uh, uh, so a 10 foot depth of tren trench translated into uh, a fire step approximately three feet above the level of the duck boards at the bottom of the trench fire step enabled them to stand with their heads above the parapet but the rest of themselves protected by the depth of the trench inside the trenches there the trench walls there would be dugouts which would take them down to an officer's quarters where uh, officers would be able to exert control over the men under their command. After this short break, we'll be taking our first visit to the battlefields. Now, welcome back to Psalm 100, a special three hour programme from Big Centre TV's doorstep history team. Now, in this part of the programme, we'll be taking a visit to the battlefields. And we'll be starting with some familiar names of trenches in the company of Terry Carter, a well known local author and contributor to doorstep history. This part of the line. Uh, was always a quiet sector, so it was always trench holding duties. Uh, they came in like a shift system, where you had the um, you had your six warwicks, the fifth warwicks, the eighth, and the seventh warwicks. Took it in turn, a few days at a time, to hold the trenches and explore no man's land, uh, to harass the Germans in their trenches, and uh, and that's how that's how it was. Yeah. So relatively peaceful. It was. This was known as a peaceful sector. Using this uh, tablet, with trench maps downloaded, and uh, the GPS system that's on the uh, tablet, we can see that the trenches round here are named after Birmingham streets. And where we're standing now, along this road, was a trench called Thorpe Street, which was where the uh, Birmingham Territorials of the Warwickshire Regiment had their headquarters. And just where we are now, going up into the distance, is Hurst Street, which is another street in Birmingham. And further on is New Street, Gooch Street, Cherry Street and Temple Street are the trenches that are around here. Now this isn't set up, this has just actually happened while we're standing here. Right by side of the road, Terry, what have we got? We've got an assortment of an empty shrapnel shells they've all been fired they're empty but these are the guys that were full of shrapnel balls basically they're like a shotgun cartridge fired from a cannon or a, a, an artillery about 300 lead shrapnel balls would have been in there and they were set to there was time to set to blow as the shell was coming down into the trenches. Part of the uh, 48th South Midland Division were also batteries of um, Midland raw field artillery. So these could have come from their, come, come their artillery fire as well. You never know. In fact, the shells could be made in Birmingham. Although we associate the month of July 1916 with the Battle of the Somme, there were many other smaller battles taking place way before then. And Terry took me to a cemetery at Arras, which contains the graves of a number of Royal Warwickshire men who were killed in June of 1916. When the, um, the, the city battalions, uh, the 14th, 15th and 16th Royal Warwicks, were a part of the 5th Division. And when the 5th Division took over this part of the front in March 1916, and then the first casualties began to occur. This is the area of a dressing station where the wounded were brought and the ones that died of wounds were, built, were buried here. And the chaplain of the 2nd Birmingham Battalion actually consecrated the ground to put the men in. Which explains why there's so many Royal Warwickshire men together. Yes, yes. If, you, if we're standing a meeting now, quite a few Royal Warwickshire men, from, mostly from Birmingham, 2nd Birmingham Battalion. Where would they have signed up for that? Uh, in the newspapers in the uh, August of 40, the, when there was a call for the Birmingham Pals, they all joined, they all put the name down on the Lord Mayor's list that was published in the Birmingham Daily Post. 
This is a 4th of June 1916 and the mostly 2nd Birmingham Battalion which, when, which was the 15th Battalion, the Royal Warwick Regiment. And on that evening, 4th of June, the uh, Germans did a trench raid. But prior to the trench raid, they blew three mines in front of, the German, in front of our trenches. And then the Germans sent about uh, 500 men over to attack. And a lot of the Birmingham Battalion men were killed in their dugouts due to the um, artillery fire and the mine explosions. Yes, the chaplain of the 2nd Birmingham Battalion, uh, when they moved up to this part of the front uh, at Arras um, and casualties started to occur, he consecrated the ground next to the dressing station. One of the most famous and well-known places on the Somme is Hawthorne Ridge, where a large crater remains to this day, following an explosion there, which took place 10 minutes before the main battle began at 7.20 a.m. on the 1st of July, 1916. Using modern GPS technology and old photographs, Terry was able to find the spot where this famous photograph of the explosion was taken. Jeffrey Malins, who filmed it from half a mile away, later said, The ground where I stood gave a mighty convulsion. It rocked and swayed. I gripped hold of my tripod to steady myself. Then, for all the world, like a gigantic sponge, the earth rose high into the air, to the height of hundreds of feet. Higher and higher it rose, and with a horrible grinding roar, the earth settled back upon itself, leaving in its place a mountain of smoke. And this is all that's left of the crater almost 100 years later. At 7.20 a.m. our mine was fired under the Hawthorne Redoubt. As the debris fell, two platoons, second Royal Fusiliers, four Vickers Maxims and four Stokes Mortars left our parapet and moved across in extending order all under Captain Ruff Russell, 2nd Royal Fusiliers. This party came under a crossfire from machine guns before reaching the crater, losing two officers and the majority of men carrying Stokes guns ammunition. Our machine guns under Lieutenant McAlpine came into action within five minutes of reaching the crater. The two to the north cleared the trench running north from the crater of, of 15 to 20 Germans. The Stokes guns opened about 7.35am but only 20 rounds a gun had came up with the battery and the carriers coming across were shot down before they could reach the mortars. At 7.25am the three leading companies of the 2nd Royal Fusiliers crossed the parapet from F Street to Bridge End. They immediately came under a heavy crossfire from machine guns and you know, they failed to get as far as the enemy wire. A large number of casualties occurred at the German strong point of High Wood and the nearby ridge. Fortified machine gun posts caused havoc when British soldiers approached from a sunken road. Many were easily picked off as they tried to advance. First objective was come here from the left, yeah. come down the cross and to get the sunken road here. Yeah. Uh, well, the Birmingham Battalion was about 700, 700 strong, 700 or something like that. Right. And they suffered, in crossing from A to B, they suffered 485 casualties. So on the July day, we didn't yeah. succeed here, did we? No, no, this was a, a fortified German machine gun position, uh, and it hung out right till the end of August 1916. So in August 1916, what happened? Well, the uh, Royal Engineer Tunnelling Company from our trenches within the wood that was held by the British, tunnelled, tunnelled under the trees, under the ground, and laid a charge. And on the 24th of August, it blew it. Blew it to Kingdom Come. 
is thought the remains of at least 800 men from both sides lie undiscovered in this area. The agricultural village of Bowman Hamel is not far from the picturesque Hawthorne Ridge Cemetery. It contains 82 graves, including those of Private Philip Osborne of Balsall Heath in Birmingham and Private John Taylor from Montague Road in Smerwick. So we're all in the middle of now, man's land, and that's what I say, that's the Hawthorne Crater. The British front line is in blue on the left. Across the area lie numerous other small cemeteries. At Bowman Hamel British Cemetery, the grave of Private Henry Taylor, a Walsall man who won the military medal, is a reminder that the battles in the area didn't start and end in July 1916. He's buried alongside men who were killed in follow-up raids in November of that year. The nearby Sierra Road No. 1 cemetery is the final resting place of Ralph Adams MC, whose father was a head teacher at City Road School, and a family member is said to have refereed the 1913 FA Cup final. But the larger Sierra No. 2 cemetery can be seen the grave of Captain James Evelyn Bevan Dixon of Augustus Road in Edgebaston. He was the grandson of the Birmingham educationalist George Dixon. Other local men buried there include Captain Stratford Ludlow from Soley Hall and Lance Corporal John Chatwin from William Street at Five Ways in Birmingham. After the break, we'll be visiting the town of Albert and discovering its links with Birmingham both during and after the war. <laughs> 